from uh, from the point of more, I suppose, in my background, more sociological than than uh, pedagogical. And um, as we've seen, I'm, I'm a great uh, fan of um, Professor Ken Roberts, He's a professor of sociology at Louisville University. And if we were allowed any longer to have grand old men of sociology, Ken Roberts would be one of them. And um, he he's but I always find it a bit disconcerting with, with Ken because uh, um, we'd always have meetings. And if you, it's sort of contradicted. We, as pedagogues, especially you're a sociologist or maybe some sort of psychologist as well, it's sort of contradicted because um, you you want to you want to feel you you want to feel that you're teaching them something, don't you? And um, you're doing something worthwhile, you know. And uh, Ken would always say, oh, never mind about that, you know. Let's just see how they are socialised. <laughs> and uh, so um, sociology doesn't take it, sort of looks at um, learning as a sort of form of adaptation or behavioural psychology as well. Um, a sort of a form of adaptation in some larger um, social organisation, really. So uh, I'm sort of questioning in a way... Um, or, um, what, asking in relation to what Sally said, you know, how how engaged are they? Are they are are they engaged? You know, and um, and and in relation to the, the question of power that you raised, Damien, they they're pretty they're pretty powerless, aren't they? Although, ironically, they've been invested with this um, consumer choice. So um, so that's where I'm coming at it from, and. Um, also, looking at it in terms of um, colleague raised the question of, of mature students, I'm not really looking at them because I think they they become a dying breed, and and, um, and so uh, the last proper book that Martin and I did, you know, with a commercial publisher, was this lost generation question mark. We weren't quite sure about it, and, and as you can see, it has this sort of uh, generic lost youth person, man, unfortunately, bloke. Um, uh, and we weren't quite sure about whether people really liked being called a lost generation. You know, maybe they didn't feel they were lost; they were sort of finding their way or something. But actually, I now see that, um, and, and that was one reason perhaps it didn't do so well as we anticipated. Aside from the cover, I <laughs> blame the cover. <laughs> um, whereas now, Rizzle Kicks have produced this uh, lost generation, which is like a, an anthem to uh, to the lost generation. Of who they seem to be speaking for. So they, they dropped the question mark. So um, I think we can, we can do that. And we, and we should look at, at this whole uh, issue from, from the point of view of sort of youth studies and generational studies, because this is a, a generational crisis, I think, that society's facing. But it's not of the type that um, Willits's silly book, The Squeeze, basically. They, they're trying to foster this uh, division between... Um, you know, older generations and, and the younger generation, and Hauker and Malik's book, The Pinch, I think, or maybe I've got them the wrong way around, I can't remember. Anyway, the same, uh, the same sort of idea, basically uh, blame, blame the, uh, the baby boomers, they, they've taken all the goodies and sitting in their nice houses and going on cruises and stuff, and they've left you, you know. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think we've got to, we shouldn't look at it like that, we should, look, it, is a, it is a generational question and a youth question, but a youth question as uh, Phil Cohen put it in Rethinking the Youth Question, um, by which he meant, I think, the youth question is how society um, incorporates successive generations um, into itself so that it continues in some or other recognisable form. Um, so, so of course it may change and there's a dialectic involved, but that that's basically it, and I think this this is a real crisis now, um, especially in, in the um, developed economies um, and Europe. I'll touch on. So, um, but it's this is a, although it's a it's a crisis that you know the that faces the, the younger generation generations. I mean, there is a lost generation since the crunch. Really, there have been se several previously. In, since, but that's a new one now. Um, uh, it also affects the older generations, including uh, including the boomers themselves, who are getting older. And uh, Lynn Siegel's book concerns them. That's a marvellous book that I read over um, weekend. I was able to take over Easter 
um, running out, out of time. It's called. I really recommend that to all the people in the world. <laughs> um, and and so we're looking at things in terms of uh, youth youth studies that Phil was connected with. You know, this sort of traditional childhood youth adulthood model and youth work as a sort of guiding the youth across the story. You're not a child, but you're on an adult, you know, and sort of mentoring thing and, and presuming that you can attain, attain this sort of adulthood, whereas I think that is actually in question now. Um, and and uh, youth was a sort of moratorium, which, <coughs> you know, since uh, Stanley Hall invented um, adolescence in 1901, and now you've got this another American, John Arnott, another American psychologist, who claims to have discovered a new phase beyond adolescence, uh, which he calls extended adulthood, which is sort of uh, adolescence is basically teenage. And so extended adulthood can go on till um, 35 or into your 40s in Japan, apparently. So, um, uh, but I think, uh, I think this is wrong, really. And, and uh, John Bunner at the Institute of Education says, no, this is nonsense, this is just prolonged youth. Look at the way they behave. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Claire Wallace and Jill Jones, who used to be here at Peel, um, in Youth, Family and Citizen, a long time ago, uh, said that really there were just two types of permitted young people. Uh, you're either a student or trainees stroke apprentices. This was the time of sort of youth, well, after youth training and so forth. Um, modern apprenticeships, and uh, but it's been rehashed recently that Matthew Hancock, last week, the week before, I haven't got the exact reference from this from Martin, but he picked it up somewhere. Um, he's he's a, a, a skills minister, the skills minister, I don't know, um, and uh, he's talking about attempting to rebalance school leaver destinations. So university or apprenticeship will be the the new norm. So that what. Claire and Jill forecast, you know, is now sort of an official policy. And there's no third option, like in uh, welfare to, New Labour's welfare to work, there's no uh, fourth option they had, because they had volunteering, but nobody did it. So. Um, and so you've got this not permitted group of people who are the needs, you know, the not in education, employment, or training. Um, who are claimed now to be down to 17.2%, although New Labour, to be fair, them got it much lower, uh, but they, they of course went up again, um, of 18 to 25 year olds. And that is even with the raising of the participation in age in, in schools <coughs> and colleges, which is now 17, you're not supposed to leave and become neat until uh, you're, you're over 17, or not, not become neat, become either a student or a trainee or an apprentice, if there's any difference. Um, or, and next year it'll be 18. So, uh, of course, if we look at the, the top lot of this, the students, there are, of course there are types of students in university. Uh, and um, at the top of this tertiary tripartism, um, you've got uh, internationally selecting researching universities. Uh, these are the, well, really it's the real Russells, <laughs> who we all know are, there are only two of them, if you don't count LSE, and I don't count the LSE because there's too many overseas students there. Uh, and because it's a little, little known thing that actually even, even um, um, UCL and Imperial, who sometimes count themselves in as the Fab Four or the Magic Five or these sort of silly sort of things that journalists on the Times Higher make up. Um, they had to go into clearing last year for at least some of their courses. So there were only two universities and LSE that did not go into clearing last year. And uh, so they compare with everybody else, and it's going to be worse this year, isn't it? Because the, the cap has been lifted and so forth. So everybody else is cramming them in, in the double dual sense of the word that Matthew Cheeseman used it in his paper about cramming in the information centre of Sheffield University. Um, and uh, they're cramming them in based on cramming that they've done in, in largely literary tests as proxies for more or less expensively acquired cultural capital. And then you've got the next lot down, 
perhaps this is where Key will find it somewhere. Or perhaps you, I don't know. Um, the nationally recruiting, these terms are supposed to match up. So they're not international, but nationally, getting students from all over the country. Um, but they're recruiting them, not selecting them. Um, because, of course, the real Russells are in a position to be able to select since they don't. They don't increase the numbers, they keep the numbers the same and therefore they can, they've got more choice and also that keeps their staff, gives them more time for researching and therefore they're in a virtuous circle. Um, but so these, uh, next, they're nationally recruiting and not researching so much but teaching and largely campus universities. Um, and then the, the sort of third lot of um, locally clearing uh, and uh, increasingly training universities, um, among whom I, I would put Greenwich, really. Um, although we hoped we'd get, we'd win out from more people, you know, when the fees went up, more people would live at home and go to their local university, but that hasn't happened, interestingly. So it's an interesting bit of decision making that we could, or um, sense making that we could discuss why that's, why that's occurred. Um, and I suppose there is um, there's a fourth group of other providers who may become increasingly intermingled with the, some of the local clearing training universities as they are getting and predicts go into management buyouts and so forth. Uh, so other providers in FE and, and private, but they haven't really expanded in the way Willits hoped. So the, the, yeah, so this has been clear for quite a long time. Uh, so Mark Wires and I were talking about this in. 2008, a tertiary tripartism. So, um, oh, what is left out of that, though, is um, science. I, I do feel that, um, and this might, might be an important thing at, at Kiel, because you've got large science, um, STEM subjects, science, um, aside from medicine, possibly. Um, but I feel that um, science is in this partly because of the funding, the STEM funding, but also the way things are developing at places like UCL or even Birmingham. You know, but I got lost wandering around Birmingham University the other day. I found myself in Birmingham City Hospital <laughs> <laughs> because they sort of merge into each other. And, and so the, these sort of um, medico-industrial complexes seem to be being created. And, and I, I feel they're probably, they're probably a polarisation in science. Um, and mainstream science probably isn't like that, but we need to look at the mainstream. And everybody's been urged, you know, do you'll get a job if you do engineering or so. Oh, I'm not sure you will, you know, because uh, engineering departments in FE have been closing for the last 20 years, and what well, sort of a job as well. So I think we need to we need to get into that. And, and it's anyway, whatever's going on, it's not a sort of uh, Polanyian ideal of a community of scientists. I don't think any longer perhaps some scientists who will talk about that or technologists. Um, so, we, we're in this um, transition, um, and this is, this is in Polish education, um, where these people with Polish names um, are saying that um, more and more students have been interested in simply obtaining a degree at the lowest possible cost, well, I put in hand effort, in order to improve their labour market position, and some higher education institutions and their branches in Poland have clearly orientated themselves towards this type of student. I feel this is happening <coughs> here. Poland is incidentally the, um, the highest participation country for, uh, alongside um, England in the EU, followed by France and Germany. And um, Lorenzo Antonucci, who is a name to watch, she, um, she writes brilliantly about sort of precarious youth and um, students, in, students particularly uh, in Italy, where she comes from, um, and, and she's saying the same sort of thing, the universities have become mass systems for young people looking for better job prospects, uh, and at the same time we've neglected, well except in Germany, the systems of vocational training, um, and universities have been transformed from providers of academic knowledge to enhancers of employability as if they were mass systems of vocational training. So, as somebody mentioned before, HE is turning into FE. Not that there's anything wrong with FE, I'll come back to that. And, of course, this isn't, this isn't a new 
this is a new situation, uh, and uh, indeed has been going on <coughs> uh, since this chap wrote about schooling uh, for a University of Greenwich final year education studies project in 2004, when the students used to put some effort into writing their uh, final year um, inquiry projects. And so he, I think he summed it up rather well what was going on in his school. But other people have done that as well. For, I mean, Warwick Mansell's wonderful Teaching by Numbers, or for America, Diane Ravitch's um, uh, Death and Life of the Great American School System. So, um, in, indeed, in America, uh, can't they, they can't be, they should come one after the other. Um, uh, in America, I think they've been facing this, uh, the United States of America, they've been facing this problem longer than we have. So, this chap, Joel Graf, writes about it. He says, We've got to understand higher education from the point of the clueless student, student who just doesn't know what the hell is going on and is trying to make sense as Sally says, of their situation. Um, yeah, that's it. Oh, that's he's saying it there. There we are. <clears throat> but on the other hand, we run into these sort of one of these postmodern blinds, veils, brick walls. I mean, I, I got this from a student um, <coughs> who found it on the internet somewhere. You buy this as a T-shirt and turn up to your seminar. She's a very good student, obviously. Um, you know, let's, let's make like I give a shit. Um, and and um, so we can we can get into these sort of postmodern games where they're pretending to learn things and we're pretending to teach them something, and maybe that's okay if we're all cynical about it. But if we're not, and we start actually believing it all. I think we're really in, in the deep deep excrement. And, and 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 I was in a school uh, sixth form just before Easter holiday and talking to um, first year of sixth form, you know, who used to be the best year. That was the best year of being the sixth form, wasn't it? But now they all, they have to meet all their modules and do everything. And, and he, the, the sociology teacher there was saying, he described, he said, I don't know what he did. Well, like all teachers, we blame ourselves, don't we, for this, you know. He said, they're, 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 they're listless is the only word he could find for them. He said, yeah. They're listless. And then he said, it must be my fault. I haven't, I haven't managed to fire them up enough, you know. And they weren't like this last year, you know. What am I doing wrong, you know. Um, so, um, um, yeah, not that. Um, so I, I think um, maybe um, insofar as you know, we might be able to operationalise Sally's um, paper as a as a research project. You know, a, a sort of title for it I can think of at the moment is sort of um, getting beneath the bullshit. But would this appeal? To, would this appeal to research funders? You know, so, I think, could we find a funder who's prepared to back this? Because um, there are people who, you know, they obviously don't want. Um, a lot of people with an investment in all this, aren't they? including students unions. I plug the Student um, Experience Network of the Society of Research for Higher Education, who, who are doing a, a, the next their next event, which you can find on the society's website, is is going to be on um, the role of students unions, and really they're they're little businesses, aren't they? They're part of the situation, really. Um, well, maybe that's not new. Maybe there are some people here who can remember reading um, National Union of Students, the Students Muffler. I seem to remember that from the old days. Um, so this is leading to the peculiar thing is that, um, you know, all the Willits idea that this would sort of empower everybody by, you know, that now they'll care now they're paying so much money. This is, again, in America, I, I wish I had seen this and thought of this reply that this man gives, you know, to this American student that went around the internet, Facebook and so forth, you know, and, and the, the students say, uh, you, you need the tone of voice, you know, I, I have to pass this semester, I mean, because she is paying £9,000 a year, so if she fails your module, it's four into £9,000, a lot of money, isn't it? So she'll do anything to, to pass the course, and so anything, <laughs> anything, <laughs> anything, anything, and then he says, well, try studying then. 
<laughs> I wish I'd thought of that. Uh, so I think students are left, uh, this is a sociological bit, they're all left running up this sort of down escalator where they're studying harder but learning less, and at, at, you know, from right the way through the system, from the schools uh, into the colleges and universities. And, um, and in, in a class structure that has gone pear-shaped, so this is one of the strange things that happens. Oh, for I said it might happen during this lecture. <laughs> um, that while you're giving a lecture, uh, somebody's taken some picture of you with something and, and tweeted it. So, uh, so that's Martin and I talking about different models of social class, and we feel that the sort of pyramid model, the post-war pyramid, you know, it, it's, it's being contested by uh, the sort of Sutton Trust, Hutton, Will, uh, Will Hutton, Alison Wolfe as well, Hourglass. Uh, version. So the pyramid has turned it in an hourglass. But actually, Martin says when you look at the earnings, you know you would expect that there would be a sort of um, a break in the graduation of earnings, which there aren't really. And and so we feel that there isn't one group up there. And anyway, the hourglass does imply that it is sort of people from the top are <coughs> dripping through into the bottom. Um, so, but we feel it's it's wrong, and and that really the, the class structure has gone pear shaped. <laughs> So, which I'll try and explain now. It's not just a slogan. Um, so, in the old days, after the war, when you had a pyramidal class structure of upper, middle, and working, and everybody sort of knew their place, um, <coughs> there was limited upward social mobility, shown by the arrow. Um, from the largely from the skilled manual section of the old, the traditionally manually working working class, which in any case was sort of divided between skilled and unskilled, uh, into the non-manually working middle class via the grammar schools. So then you had a tertiary tripartism, the technical schools didn't really take off, so you ended up with a sort of bipartism, really, as everybody says. So that's limited up with social mobility that ended coincident with but not as a consequence of the introduction of comprehensives. This is a bit of history that Gove needs to be corrected of. He thinks if he can reintroduce social mobility, uh, he'll bring back grammar schools or grammar schools will reintroduce social mobility. Um, and you can see this is not just if you look at, uh, um, at the United States uh, because uh, they had all through High, uh, secondary high schools from after the war. So, but the same thing happened. It, um, the, the limited upward social mobility ended in the 1970s uh, and on into the 80s. So, what's happened now is, uh, uh, um, we think that that division, old division. Uh, no, I don't think that helps me. Really. <laughs> Between. Working has been elided largely through the use, the application of new technologies. So you've got a sort of new middle working or working middle class that all the politicians address themselves to, the, the hard working people, which implies, of course, you've got this group of not hard working people who are the so called underclass. And um, you've got to say so called, I think, um, because um, although there has been a um, a re recomposition of the reserve army of labour, as Marxists would put it. Um, there's, there's sort of churning which goes on. It's not a, um, Andy Furlong in Glasgow and um, Rob McDonald at Teesside, which are places you would expect if there was a so called underclass, it might exist. They can't find more than about 3% of people who are like sort of permanently generationally unemployed, whose grandparents were unemployed, parents and so forth. And so there isn't this sort of culture of poverty, um, self-generating underclass. Although Ken Roberts does say it may exist if things go on the way they are, with absolute downward social mobility indicated by this arrow. So, um, yeah, so then you've got, perhaps you've got a, people used to talk about correspondence, didn't they? There was a correspondence with the old secondary tripartism with the class structure and the employment structure. And so have we got a correspondence now, or is education just sort of totally dysfunctional? I mean, um, maybe Gove thinks he can sort of force this new correspondence and 
he and Willits hand in glove, although apparently they potentially dislike each other, um, to, to reduce the number of uh, people going on to higher education. And um, But then that still leaves them with the problem of the old correspondence. What do you do with the other half of our future? Half our future is the Newsom report, all in 1963. So there seems to be a sort of rough correspondence with, I'm not sure about studio schools, they seem to mean different things at different times <coughs> to different people. And poor old F.E. has been cut out ever since. Um, they have sort of saved the sixth forms. Teachers have got a bit to blame for that, I think. Okay. So, um, Patrick, excuse me. I see you've got studio schools there. Yeah, I'm not sure I, about I them. I wonder whether we should put university texts in. Uh, yes, good point. Okay. I, I think they vary. So, um, yeah, Greenwich has a yeah. supposedly yeah. one of these, but I, like, I think um, it may be different from like the one at Aston University, which may be feeding people on into either into engineering courses at Aston or into Aston Martin, if that still exists. Just to pick up from Sally's um, paper, it's like um, AG is now going to become a major vocational provider. Well, yeah, that's what the yeah. Polish people were saying. And I, I come back to that in relation to further education. So, yeah, so that's about the churning and uh, Ken Roberts... Um, Sort of declaring there is, there is no social mobility except downwards, absolute downward social mobility. There's not even relative up and down. Um, so, yeah, in, in terms of thinking about this in relation to, to further education, perhaps we can think about it in terms of um, higher education seems to have this sort of logic of supposedly going higher. So you, you, you sort of go climb your ivory tower and you sort of look down and you get this sort of overview of everything that's going on <coughs> on the ground beneath, you know. Whereas um, further education has the logic of sort of going further. <laughs> but it doesn't take you higher necessarily. This is about Tony Weaver, you know, the chap who, civil servant who wrote the paper for the um, polytechnics, crossing the polytechnics. See, uh, I got it from there, really. Um, higher, higher than where, further than what. I think we've got to ask that. Um, particularly, again, perhaps in relation to these STEM subjects and engineering. I think, well, the, the chap is head of engineering at UCL, so he didn't really see any difference between what he was doing and what they did in engineering and courses in FE. They were just taking people further. Um, and and um, But obviously, um, you, so you, you could sort of... I've got sort of corresponding terms with all this. Um, uh, so, supposedly, uh, supposedly you, you acquire skills and knowledge or combine those two as expertise, Harry Collins has recently written about. And whereas the corresponding terms here are, are competence and information. So, you can, you know, competence based teacher training, for example, is a good example. Um, which incidentally started off in further education as a sort of tra in trade teacher colleges, found its way into higher education, but is now in, it's, it's an example of further education in higher education because it's all, it's all competence based and it's assessed by, by a government agency, so um, really it's, it's further in higher and um, I suppose the higher in further, which there is some of that as well. But uh, Ruth Silver, I think she, she used to be the principal of um, Lewisham College, which was one of our uh, partner colleges. But she was clever. She, she was a sort of mover and shaker in the further education world. Did you come with um, And she played off one against the other, South Bank against Goldsmiths against Greenwich, refused to get sort of tied in. And, um, and, and so she said, you know, well... While these people are at Goldsmiths or Greenwich or South Bank, sort of supposedly going higher and getting all this theoretical knowledge, uh, that employers predictably are going to say, well, that's no use, you know, that's all book stuff, isn't it? You can't actually do anything. You don't know how to fix the photocopier. Work in a team or whatever, you know, do accounts, um, spreadsheets, whatever. She said, well, at Lewisham College, we've got people, you know, who've been teaching people how to do spreadsheets and accounts and all these things that employers are going to ask for. And so why, while you're supposedly going higher and getting this sort of overview of everything, like an architect might have a view over the whole sort of site, whereas 
the man on the ground who might have done all the competencies, or a woman on the ground, might have done all the competencies in um, you know, plumbing, electrical, carpentry. It might be the most skilled person on the site, but it's still not going to have that sort of overview of why the thing is being built as it is, and so forth. And maybe even the architect hasn't got that, I don't know. Um, that um, why not combine these two things? And, um, and then you would have what should send, while they're supposedly going higher, and, and employers are only going to say, well, you know, why can't they fix a photocopy? You, you give them courses and all that at, at Lewisham College. So they can, they can do both. And so uh, she said, then you would create thick HE, but never caught on. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, that might be, um, that might be um, a, a point, you know, a way to sort of think about some of this. And, and as I say, the sort of corresponding terms of um, skill and knowledge Confidence, information, and, um, and and bearing in mind there is, you know, there, as I say, there's no further. You can't you can't have education without uh, training, really, can you? I mean, you've got to sort of sit down and practice typing, put your finger in the right place, if you're playing a piano, whatever you're doing, you know, and then you you sort of master that, and then then you can move on. But you can have uh, training without education, as I think. We do have more and more, not only in further education, where maybe it's okay, but in higher education as well. So I don't know if that, I don't know if that helps people to sort of think about this. Um, and and um, then this is just advertising. <laughs> so uh, since um, the lack of success with um, Lost Generation, we, we went into publishing ourselves. And um, we did two books last year. And... Um, this is our business plan. That uh, they've got to be short and readable because nobody reads books nowadays, <laughs> unless they're short and readable. Um, and and also got to be cheap. So cover coffee prices is the slogan. So sort of fiver at the most. And then when we've covered our costs, we make them available for free downloads. So trouble we left. Trouble is, what's missing out of this is any sort of advertising. So nobody's nobody's heard about this. Although we did get an endorsement from Christine Blower for Education Beyond the Coalition, which is a, a collection um, that Martin and I edited and, and has got um, uh, people here would be interested in the last very thoughtful chapter by Ken Jones, for instance. Um, and, but also people at every level of um, learning. So uh, Claire and Kelly also at Goldsmiths Primary and then going through a very good chapter, I think, on further by um, Robin Simmons at Huddersfield. Um, and, and Martin was insistent everybody had to put forward sort of practical. You can't, it's just not all sort of knocking copy about neoliberalism, this, that, and the other. You know, you've got to say, well, how could things possibly be organised? So people have all suggested those, but they, they don't necessarily add up to a, a programme or anything, obviously, because we're all writing from our own point of view. But I do think, you know, hopefully they're valuable anyway. And then, and then we did this other one about um, the great reversal, uh, which is you know what we saw Willits and Gove at together. Um, but then this shows the um, the hazards of um, instant publishing, <laughs> in that we knock this thing out quickly, like the way Martin's doing the research on apprenticeships now. We probably have it out fairly soon. You know, someone who's putting together a research proposal into a bridge by the time they get it through, if they do, you know. They do it and everything. Everybody's have forgotten those apprenticeships. Before they invented a new lot by then. So uh, the, the troll was, um, yeah, it includes a critique of the EBAC, but of course, go went and abolished the EBAC. So we had to bring out, that's the first edition, we had to bring out the second edition. <laughs> and, uh, uh, it didn't need much changing, unfortunately. So, so there we are, that's, um, that's the advertising. And, um, and yeah, you can get these from our website, blog, and um, find us on these, uh, these places, including on Facebook. Can you send so. everybody a link to the, the contact details as well? Yeah, could you? Mm -hmm. All right, later. So I don't know if that helps or not. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.